Welcome from Wesley Church in Reading. This weekend is the coronation of the King, and it's a time that some see as a new beginning, a new era. Norman will be talking to us shortly about the place of the anointing in the coronation service, and he will lead us in a prayer. After that, Nick will take a look at the promises of new beginnings, of the new heavens and the new earth contained in the prophecies of Isaiah. But before all that, a hymn about Jesus the King. When the King's coronation takes place on the 6th of May, it will include three significant ceremonies, his taking of oaths, his anointing and the crowning, 
it is the anointing which is the most sacred moment. It signifies God's blessing being conferred on the king and his consort during the ceremony, just as anointing does during baptism, confirmation and the ordination of a priest. While water is used in baptism signifies the washing away of sin, sticky oil represents the sticking or lasting nature of a blessing. Anointing a chosen leader is mentioned several times in the Old Testament. Saul was singled out as a ruler through anointing. Samuel took a phial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, The Lord has anointed you rule of his people Israel. There are several references in the Old Testament to David's anointing by a priest, but it is Solomon, David's son, who is perceived as the ideal king in the British coronation tradition. For more than a thousand years, the words of 1 Kings 1, 38-40 have been said during the coronation, and since the 18th century, sung as an anthem specially composed by Handel for the coronation of George II. Just as somebody is only baptised once, or confirmed or ordained once, so anointing of a monarch only happens at the coronation. Roman Catholics and Anglicans would see this as akin to a sacrament, an outward sign of inward grace. It is so powerful a moment that it should be spiritually sustained the person for the rest of their life. The oil being used during the coronation is called chrysum, which is, means a mixture of balsam and olive oil and comes from the Latin, Greek and Hebrew words meaning to anoint. It is also usually perf perfumed and the combination of fragrance and richness from the oil was seen as symbolising the gifts of the Holy Spirit combined with Christian virtue. The oil has been perfumed with sesame, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, amber and orange blossom. The oil being that is being used is powerfully connected to his family history. The oil has come from olives in, harvested from two groves on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, one of them linked to the Monastery of Mary Magdalene, the monastery is the burial place of the king's paternal grandmother, Princess Alice of Greece. The Anglican Archbishop of Jerusalem and the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem have both consecrated the oil together, making a historic ecumenical moment in the history of British coronations. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who will officiate at the coronation, was instrumental in this special consecration. He said, since the beginning of the planning of the coronation, his desire has been for a new coronation oil to be produced using olive oil from the Mount of Olives. This demonstrates the deep historic links between the coronation, the Bible and the Holy Land. It is not clear if we will see the anointing. At the last coronation of Elizabeth II in 1953, the anointing was hidden from view beneath a canopy. She was, as was tradition, anointed on her head, hands and breast, and was divested of her coronation robes for this moment, leaving her in a white linen shift. It is also not clear what the king will wear for the coronation. The queen consort will also be anointed, but only on her head. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, the fountain of all goodness, as we crown Charles to be our King and Camilla our Queen, we ask that your spirit of wisdom, justice and understanding may rest upon them for as long as they reign over us. Enrich them with the Holy Spirit, give them your heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness and humility and bring them into your everlasting kingdom. We would ask your blessing on all those involved in the state but also the religious ceremony, other members of the royal family, those invited to be part of the ceremony in Westminster Abbey, and those who officiate and carry out the necessary duties of the occasion. May it truly be a weekend of celebration. May your spirit continue to guide both King Charles and Queen Camilla in all their royal duties as they represent our country in the days that lie ahead. May his reign be one full of peace, justice for this nation and for the wider commonwealth of nations. We pray this in the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. There is
Sovereign God, we adore, honor, and glorify you. We are privileged to be called your children. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that pleads on our behalf when we are weak. We thank you for the church family, our own families, and the lives of the young people. You welcome and accept all your children with open arms of compassion despite our imperfections. You show your love among us by sending your only son into the world so that we might live through him. We are sorry when we allow the challenges in our world to stop us from dwelling on your love to sustain our hope in your son, Jesus Christ. We are sorry when we do not love each other enough. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We ask for forgiveness of sins. Give us the strength to be able to live according to your will and help us to rely on your word so we can be guided away from sin. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to reflect on your word. Your word promises that you will redeem your people. You will create a new world. Thank you that in worship we can put aside the uncertainties of this world to only rely on faith in your word and promises. Let your Holy Spirit fill everyone with the power of your grace to make this act of worship acceptable to you, O Lord our God. Amen. Behold, I will create new heaven and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of the weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will they be in it an infant who lives at but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. 
he who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen one will long enough the work of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be the people blessed by the Lord they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. Will they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat the straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy, on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Amen. Behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. Through Isaiah, God lays out a vision of a new world for his people. And what a wonderful vision it is. This new world will be joyful. God's people will rejoice together with God in God's creation, with no reason to cry. This new world will be healthy. There will be no children dying a few days after they are born. In fact, nearly everyone will live beyond a hundred. This new world will be just. God's people will get fair pay for their work, live in the homes they build, and eat the food that they grow. This new world will be peaceful. The strong and the weak will live together while those who deceive like the serpent will be thrown into the dust. It is an awesome description of a radical transformation of the world from the one that Isaiah and his contemporaries experienced, and indeed the one that we experience today. Over the many times that I listened to and read through this passage, I felt a range of emotions which I want to try to use to frame the interpretation of this vision of God's new world. Let's start with joy. There certainly is joy in this passage. It's a passage that, on the face of it, should inspire a sense of wonder at God's power, feelings of thanksgiving and praise for the world that is to come. In fact, when I read it, I find myself thinking that my mind and my heart and my soul should be filled with overwhelming joy. I find myself trying, struggling, almost longing to build up that joy, coming up with adjective after adjective to try to convince that joy to bubble up inside me. It's wonderful. It's awesome. It's fantastic. See what God will do for his people. And yet, I, I wonder if for you, like for me, this passage actually stirs a bit of a mixture of emotions, a mixture that it took me a little bit of time to tease apart. There is joy in me, yes, don't get me wrong, but I also feel a sense of dismay, a little bit of sadness, a sense of longing and impatience, and finally a sense of conviction. So let's move to dismay and sadness. Perhaps you might think that an unusual response to this passage, but Isaiah spoke to God's people at a particularly low point in their history. The Israelites had turned their backs to God, refused to listen to his word or obey his laws, and worshipped other gods instead. Through their wickedness, Israel lost God's, God's protection the country was overrun and the people were taken away into exile in Babylon. In Isaiah 44, God promises restoration to the exiled people. There's a passage there that reads, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams onto the dry ground. 
I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. And indeed, after around 70 years, God allowed some of the exiles to return to Judah. Yet, in stark contrast to those words of Isaiah 44, those who arrived in Jerusalem found anything but a flourishing land. They found a city laid to waste, the walls broken, the temple destroyed, the city a ghost town. In exile, one can picture the faithful closing their eyes and imagining an Israel restored by God's blessings, strong, powerful, stable. When they opened their eyes in Jerusalem, they were met with a harsh reality. You can almost hear the people crying out, Why? Why? Why have we not yet received God's promised kingdom? Much like those Israelites, when I listened to this passage, I closed my eyes and imagined God's vision of a new heaven and a new earth, a world restored, a kingdom of peace, justice, and joy. And then I opened my eyes. In many ways, our world is far better than what the Israelites experienced in Jerusalem 2,500 years ago. But in many other ways, it is not. Our world is still not fair. Our world is still not peaceful. Our world is still not just. When I opened my eyes, I remembered a visit I made to Madagascar three years ago. Those of you who know me will know that I used to travel quite a lot when I worked at the university, often to uh, parts of the developing world. And in, in those, that time in Madagascar three years ago, I was one hot afternoon, I was walking down a street in the capital of Antananarivo. And as I walked, I saw several children following me, chattering away. I knew they were asking me for something. I assumed it was money. Then I realized they were pointing, pointing not at my wallet, but at the plastic water bottle that I was carrying. They were desperate for that bottle, not, f not necessarily for the water, though I imagine that would have been appreciated, but for the plastic, which they could recycle for a coin or two. Children, children no older than my children, whose existence involves chasing people down in the street to be the first to grab an empty plastic bottle. And so my dismay, my sadness at reading this passage comes from the stark contrast between the new earth God describes and the world in which we live. How far we still have to go. So let's move to longing and impatience. The Israelites returning from exile asked, why, why, why have we not yet received God's promised kingdom? We too may long for God's new world, asking why our world continues to suffer despite God's promise of redemption. Seemingly in response, we have the first section of chapter 65, the bit that comes before that verse 17 where we started. And in that passage, God describes the people's continued unfaithfulness, even after returning from exile. The obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. God says they sacrifice in gardens, perhaps referring to fertility rituals, pagan fertility rituals. They, they sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil. They consult the dead scrying, these sorts of things. Verse 7 says that God will measure into their laps the full payment for their, for, for their former deeds. I am sure that we could also identify many ways in which our world falls short of God's expectations. Yet, this line of reasoning leads to an argument that I find uncomfortable and quite difficult to accept. That like a parent punishing a child, God is withholding a renewed world from us because of our sin. That God continues to allow seemingly meaningless suffering because we are not faithful. This argument smacks of the reasoning that Job's friends used to explain Job's 
apparent extreme misfortune. You remember Job, who had everything taken away from him. He must have angered God somehow. It paints God as vengeful, full of retribution, angrily passing judgment on any who would go against him. It ignores God's love for his people and for his world, which is at the very foundation of his promise of a new earth, and indeed at the very foundation of Christ's sacrifice, which bought us salvation from our sins, the very sins that this argument would use to bring down divine judgment on us. Yet still, still we wait longingly, impatiently for that new world. Finally, let's move to conviction. End on a high note. The conviction, I feel, after reading this passage, is rooted in those comparisons between God's promised world and the world in which we live today. Those comparisons that at first prompted some sadness and dismay. It is also rooted in an interesting literary distinction in the first verse of the passage. In my Bible, and indeed on the screen, uh, in many of the translations that I examined, the beginning of verse 17 is translated as, See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. However, in the Hebrew, I think, instead of will create, the world is simply, the word is simply create. Not will create in the future, but I create now new heavens and a new earth. This is an important distinction. It changes God's new world from a vision of a distant future to a more immediate goal. It means that God is creating this new world continually throughout time. It is a process, apparently a long one, at least by human standards. God is renewing the world in Isaiah's day, in Paul's day, in Martin Luther's day, in John Wesley's day, in our day, and in our children's and grandchildren's and great-grandchildren's days. Swapping will create for create also involves us as part of God's creation more directly in God's process of renewal. For if God creates this world today, then surely God intends for us to be part of that creation. The Bible is full of examples that prove God works through his people to fulfill his promises, works through us. Surely, surely we must believe that we have inherited those promises with roles to play in moving God's world forward towards his vision. We must respond to this vision with conviction, conviction to use those gifts and indeed the lives that God has given us to improve the world around us. So if you remember one message from this morning, remember this. As God's creation, you, all of you, all of us, we are part of his vision for a more perfect world. And that is cause for joy. Amen.
Isaiah 65 24 tells us that God says before they call I will answer while they are still speaking so God hears us even on our hearts what is on our hearts we commit the Ukraine war into your hands we commit worsening migration and refugee crisis related global economic and financial difficulties climate change and continuing oppression and injustices in our world. Our Heavenly Father, we have not done enough to look after your creation and have contributed to climate change. Give us a better sense of responsibility and inspire us and our politicians to work together to restore a natural balance of sharing and consumption. Lord, inspire us to love our neighbors near and far so that justice and fairness will prevail. As we pray for honesty in politics, we also pray for world peace and for all countries experiencing unrest, poverty, and dictatorship. We pray for governments and world bodies to genuinely care for the needs of the poor. We pray for those known to us for whom we carry concerns, the bereaved, the unwell, the anxious, the lonely, Father God, bring them relief, healing, and comfort. Lord, give us the wisdom and strength to play our part to make this a better world for all of us. We believe in a redeeming Lord in power, truth, and grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>